Hannah, the executive director of Priest for Life. Thank you for joining me once again. Well, so many of you have heard the phrase Roe v. Wade, okay? And that terrible Supreme Court decision that got thrust on us back on January 22nd, 1973. You know, let's get rid of some terminology. Okay, abortion is not the law of the land. It was thrust upon us by a Supreme Court decision. Now you might say, well, how did that come about? Well, we know personally, Father Pavone and I know personally, the Jane Roe, the Roe of that Roe v. Wade decision. Roe, of course, was Norman McCorvey. And Wade, he was the district attorney in Dallas, Texas at the time. And so that's how this case got started. Norman McCorvey, first of all, here's some facts you need to know. Number one, Norma never had an abortion. She actually gave birth to three children. Uh, her first child that she gave birth to out of wedlock, uh, her mom helped her raise. And uh, the second one, again, her mom helped her raise. And now with the Roe baby, uh, basically uh, Norma had no money, no job. Uh, she was living a little bit of a wild life, she would tell you, uh, on the wild side. And her mother had said to her, that's it. I can't deal with this helping you raise any more kids, Norma, and with your lifestyle. Uh, you got to deal with this by yourself. So she basically was almost like homeless. And she was taken advantage of by uh, Sarah Weddington. In fact, uh, it was over a lunch. Norma was actually starving hungry. And uh, Sarah Weddington heard of Norma McCorvey that this woman was wondering about abortion. Mm, is that a way to solve my problem? Well, I don't know, but here in Texas, I don't think I can get an abortion. Someone told her about it, okay? And by the way, Sarah Weddington herself had an abortion. So she already had like an agenda, like I did this, this should be legal so all women can get abortions. They shouldn't have to travel to another state because you see, before Roe v. Wade, all right, abortion was only legal in five states in the United States, New York and California being two of those five. Uh, but in Dallas, Texas, where Norma was from, abortion was not legal. And so over a pizza lunch, Sarah Weddington convinced Norma that if she just signed here, uh, we could help you get an abortion. Now, that was so ridiculous because Sarah Weddington knew the time a trial would take. It could never have happened uh, in that amount of time. But anyway, P.S. to fast forward. After Norma signed on the dotted line, she basically never saw Sarah Weddington again until many, many years later. All right, this, this happened all the way back in, the oof, it must have been 1970, when the case first began. Uh, of course, it took three years uh, to become a law. And Norma found out by picking up the morning paper and, and looking at the paper, seeing that this case was, you know, finally solved. She hadn't heard from Sarah Weddington. She hadn't spent one day in court. Well, Norma, for a little while, she still stayed on the pro-choice side, but Norma was always a free spirit. And she would think about, well, you know, how good is abortion uh, for, for women? Maybe it's not the best thing. And, and sometimes they, would, they finally got to the point where they, uh, people wanted to know who was Roe. Um, so Norma, one of her early books was I Am Roe. She wrote this book with the assistance, obviously, of a publisher. She really didn't do the book. There was a ghostwriter who wrote the book for Norma. And the pro boards had like a, a big rally and they invited Norma to it. And Norma tells some funny stories because um, uh, someone said, to the, oh, what are you here for? Are you here to do media? She said, oh, I think I am the media because I'm the Jane Roe of, of Roe v. Wade. Well, a few more years went by and Norma uh, eventually um, converted to be pro-life. What happened was she went to work for an abortion clinic and right next door to that abortion clinic was Operation Rescue. Uh, and they had a pregnancy uh, help center. So now you had Norma working in the abortion clinic here and the, uh, the folks from Operation Rescue right next door. And of course, um, some of the things that the abortion clinic told Norma to do, she didn't agree with. She would honestly ask the women, now you sure you don't want to have this baby? Abortion clinic workers didn't like what she would say these kind of things. Well, eventually she got to know the people at Operation Rescue uh, by coming out, smoking a cigarette, and they would, they would say, good morning to her. Hey, Ms. Norma, how you doing? This and that. And in time, there was a little girl named Emily who really invited Norma to church, and that was the first crack in the dam for Norma. Church? Why do I want to go to church? Well, Emily's invitation and her family brought Norma to church eventually, and from that 
Norma decided it took a while. She wasn't a quick sell. It took a while. Uh, then she went back to church again and again. And before long, Norma was baptized by Reverend Flip Benham, and um, and she became 100% pro-life. And of course, in uh, a few years later, uh, she became Catholic. And Father Pavone, along with Father Robinson, were the two people uh, that were responsible for bringing Norma into the Catholic Church. And uh, Father Pavone actually confirmed Norma into the Catholic Church. And I was there in Dallas, Texas, in that church where Father Robinson and Father Pavone brought Norma into the Catholic Church. And actually, I was sitting right next to Norma, and her, her godmother was on the other side of her. And it's been a thrill. But of course, Norma uh, was involved in the pro-life movement. And now we're going to go back to a show that Father Pavone and I did with Norma all over a decade ago and uh, see what Norma has to say in her own words uh, about her journey in the pro-life movement and, of course, becoming the Jane Roe and becoming 100% uh, pro-life and uh, also her, her struggle and work to try to see this decision overturned in her lifetime. And unfortunately, Norma did not see that happen. Norma passed away in uh, 2017. Uh, but Father Pavone and I were very, very dear friends of hers all through this time. We helped her in many, many ways. So let's take a look at this show right now to see in Norma's words uh, about her pro-life journey. One of the most important conversions ever to the pro-life side. Find out next on Gospel of Life. Hello, I'm Father Frank Pavone, Director of Gospel of Life Ministries. Welcome to our program. As usual, we're joined by our Associate Director, Janet Morana. Today, we welcome a very special friend, a very important person. But before we introduce her, I want to read for you a quote that she wrote. I sit across from a playground that I visited this eve with a small child. I know of such places where children play. I know that I am the cause of them not being here today. Why would she think she's the cause of the children not being there? Because she was the plaintiff of the Roe versus Wade Supreme Court decision that legalized abortion throughout all nine months of pregnancy in America, the Jane Roe of Roe versus Wade. She was that Jane Roe, but she is Roe no more because now she is pro-life she renounces that decision, and she works full-time to bring an end to abortion. I want to welcome Miss Norma McCorvey to the program. Norma, good to have you with us again. Good to see you too, Father. So you're doing okay? I am doing great. We're, we're giving trouble to the abortion industry. Oh, and, wonderful, uh, wonderful. As is Janet and all our team. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so we wanted to bring you on again today to the program to, to give everyone an update because as I go around and, you know, I, I always talk about the fact that we've known each other for um, over a decade now and, and we've worked together in many ways and people hear that the former Jane Roe is now pro-life and they always ask me, how is Norma doing? Yeah. So I wanted to give them a chance to let you answer that question in person. Oh, thank you, Father. I'm, I'm doing well. Um, I, I just made my first pro-life commercial in Phoenix, Arizona. It's going to be aired nationally, hopefully by October the 1st. Then I uh, went to the Wichita Awakening, uh, and Troy Newman from Operation Rescue was able to close down uh, George Tiller for a hundred no uh, for thirty eight days. Yes, That's that right. was very exciting. You yes. know, and so I mean, praise God for Troy Newman and his all his efforts that's going on there in Wichita, Kansas. Mm -hmm. I have um, let's see endorsed Senator Sam Brownback for the next pro presidential nominee. Mm -hmm. um, I met him at the fundraiser here in Dallas for the uh, Justice Foundation. And uh, testified for him before the Senate subcommittee um, in Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, Sandra Cano and I both did that. Um, so, you know, Father, we're, we're just 
we're picking them up and setting them down. <laughs> you know, you're in Texas. Yes. You have to talk Texas. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. Well, it sure is great to, to know that you're, you're, you're doing all these things. You're obviously doing a lot of activities in conjunction with a lot of our friends in the pro-life movement. Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, you know, all of this is, is really, a, all of this is part of repentance, isn't it? Yes, because it is. Because you, you were involved in a, in a, the worst decision that the Supreme Court ever made. I, I think it's the worst decision that any human government or you authority ever made. And but but now you know you have this beautiful life of everything you're doing is is making up for that. Yeah, yeah. You know it it, it and it, it is it, it's it's so scripture because you know whatever the devil meant for evil, God and takes it turn takes it and turns it around and, and makes it good. Yes. I mean, with South Dakota coming up with their laws a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. that almost passing, and then uh, with the exception, um, you know, someone called me from the press and they said, what do you think about this? And I said, you know, it's a baby step, but it's the first step in the right direction. Exactly. That's right. right. You know, Norma, so many people just don't understand the facts of what happened. You know, I get asked this question all the time about you, of course. And, of course, I'm privileged to say that I have no you, so I feel like I can answer some of the questions. But people don't realize, first of all, that uh, when the other side came to you, Sarah Weddington, to tell you, oh, we can help you with your problem, you were already pregnant, right? right? She knew darn well that your case would never see the light of day in time to help you truly, right. you know, that, uh, you know, it wasn't going to happen. But yet... She took advantage of you, basically. She did. She did, right? She did. And some people don't realize is that, number one, you never had the abortion, did you? No, I've never had the abortion. Right. And you have never had an abortion, have no, you? No, never. Right. No. And the Roe be- the Roe baby was given up for adoption, and the Roe baby is out there somewhere. And I know you, you have never met the child, but I also know that only you know a way to only identify that child, because I know, unfortunately, there have been people Many have claimed, claimed to have been the Roe baby. I've, I've had at least 30, 35 women, you know, yeah. at different times, you know, write me letters, send me videotapes yeah. um, saying that they were the Roe baby. And th- this one lady, um, a little oriental lady, she sent me this video and she says, Oh, so I know I'm not a Roe child. You know, I'm going like, I don't think so, sugar, right. you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was a thought, you know. And another fact I think that people don't realize is that once, you know, Sarah Weddington got you to sign on the dotted line, you really didn't hear from her. And basically, you found out on that January 22nd, 1973, that Roe became law, just like everyone else did, by reading the Dallas Morning News, right? I I read it in the the Dallas Times Herald. That's when we had two newspapers in Dallas. Now we only have one, and it's very liberal. Um... And uh, but yes, I, I I came in from work. I picked up the newspaper, sit down in a, the lower right hand corner. It said in a matter so factly article that the Supreme Court in a five uh, seven to two decision had legalized abortion in the case of Roe versus Wade and in the companion case of Doe versus Bolton mm-hmm. that women were able to choose to abort their children. Wow. And how did that make you feel that day when you saw that? You know, Father, I got to confess to you, I got up and I had to get a beer. Because I was, it it just, it shocked me. It really did, it shocked me. I, I, I really didn't even understand what the word abortion meant. I've got to confess that too. And I, I, was, I was in shame for a great many years. And I, I drank a great deal. I... I did everything like in the world right. to to keep everything suppressed. And that behavior is not the behavior of somebody who, who just won something that they really wanted. Um, that's the behavior of someone who, uh, who was used and manipulated. Yeah. yeah. Well, because like I said, it wasn't like Sarah Winnington called you to say, Norma, we, you know, it, most people, congratulations, congratulations. Yeah, yeah. you know, most people, if, if, if you have, have, have a lawyer who's bringing a case before the court, they're going to call their client to say, we won, but you didn't hear a peep out of her. I mean, no. it's incredible. Yeah. Well, now you are pro-life without exception, without apology. I like that t-shirt that you have 100% pro-life. Yes. No exceptions. No compromise. No compromise. No apology. That's right. 
Yeah, we don't take any prisoners or hostages. <laughs> you know, it's either you're pro-life or you're, you know, you're just out of the circle. You know, one of the things that's happened since we've had you on the program uh, um, that I'd like you to share your, your thoughts about, then we'll take a little break, is uh, that the partial birth abortion procedure has now been banned and that the Supreme Court has has upheld that ban. I mean, for the first time now since Roe v. Wade, mm -hmm. our country has begun to to ban abortion procedures. How did that decision make you feel? Oh, listen, when I first heard about that, Father, I just, I jumped up for joy. You know, I thought, my my goodness, the Supreme Court has finally found some sense, you know. Uh, and from what I understand, it was, who wasn't it, what, what, wasn't it Kennedy that wrote the dissent? Yeah. You know. Well, Kennedy wrote the, the, the decision. this this decision, decision. He, he, he wrote yeah. this, this. He was with us on this one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, it, and I was just like, yeah, I right. can't believe this. You know, why they? It's a step forward. Yeah, yeah. Because our viewers may not realize that Norma tried to petition the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade. You petitioned them and they refused to hear your case. So I think you must have been very sad about that. But now to see this little hope that this was upheld, yes. you must have said, OK, Yahoo, we're on yeah, the right we're track the now. Right yeah. track. Yeah. We're yeah. On the right it's not track. the final goal, but it's a we're step forward. Yeah. 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 Well, let's take a little break and then we'll uh, we'll continue talking uh, about more updates. We're talking with Norma McCorvey, the former Jane Roe of the Supreme Court's Roe v. Wade decision. And she is pro-life. We'll be right back. There's nothing wrong with your television set. You don't see anything because there's nothing there. Abortion, the most common surgery in America. Why don't we ever see what it looks like? A message from Priests for Life. The decision to have an abortion not only affects that moment in your life. Kristen Gordon. It affects many precious moments to come. I now pronounce you man and wife. Please remember, where there's life, there's hope. A message from Priests for Life. Well, welcome back. We're talking with Norma McCorvey, the former Jane Roe of Roe v. Wade, now pro-life and spending all her time and energy working to restore protection to the unborn child. Uh, Norma, your ministry used to be called Row No More. Yes. Uh, tell us what it's called now. It's called Crossing Over Ministry. And, you know, I, I really have to give Priest for Life and you the credit for all that because you uh, had me go to a Rachel's Vineyard, you know, post-abortion retreat. Yes. And that's when, you know, I went to the Lord and I asked him, I said, you know, I don't understand what's going on. I said, I feel like I'm crossing over mm. because I, I've, I was able to let all those frustrations out at that retreat. You know, so thank you. You're thank welcome. Thank you again. You're welcome. And, and how I, I was there with you, Norman. I yes, remember yes. that. Yes, and are. I remember you said that you up to that retreat, you felt like you had the weight of all those babies on your shoulders. Yes. And I think what you did was you, you crossed over and gave it up to the Lord and said, that's right. The Lord has forgiven me. I'm not going to be burdened by this anymore. Right. I'm going to cross over into the life of the Lord now and go on from here. And I know you've been encouraging so many other people who want to come out of the abortion industry that they can cross over with you yes. like you did. Yes. Come into being pro-life and, and work for the Lord. You know, if, if I could just get all those women together again, because there were five people that left after I did uh, from the abortion mill, uh, and, and just reunite with them and just to see how they're doing, mm. that would just, that I think that would just be so out there. Now, you had a very good experience with the Rachel's Vineyard Retreat. Tell us a little bit about that. And, uh... Well, you know, it, it was a simple fact, Father and Janet, that, you know, we were, were, we were united. We were there for a specific reason. We, we all knew going into it that it was going to be a hard weekend. You know, that I, I'm not post-abortive, but I'm post-abortive from the abortion industry. Yes. And, you know, and so... Uh, when when I was talking to um, Dr. Um, Teresa, 
you know, and I said, you know, well, what's with all the candles and the branches, you know? And she says, oh, well, this, you know, that's what our newsletter is called, Vines and Branches, I believe is what she said. And I said, oh, okay. Because, see, that's what we used to do in the goddess movement, you know, when I was still a pro board. Uh, We'd light candles and have stuff like that, you know. And it just it just kind of like, wait a minute, what's going on here? It's a flashback. Yeah. You know, yeah, it was a flashback, exactly. You know, but then I, I something inside my soul just said, go with it. Go with it. And so I just went with it. Mm-hmm. You know, and ah, the you know, those those little Italian, you know, pastries that you had sent in that day. Uh-huh. I, uh, what are they called? Um, <laughs> cannolis. Cannolis. Oh, they're so good. <laughs> I like the food on the retreat, yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, well, the Rachel's but, Vineyard retreats bring many benefits. But I think the most important benefits. thing was, besides the pastries, was the fact that at the end, we celebrated. We had a, a ceremony of the resurrection, and yes. we, we celebrated the fact that we, we did give it all over to the Lord yeah. and realized the total forgiveness and mercy yes. that he had for us. Yeah. Now, Norma, the, um, another thing you participated in with us not too long ago was the uh, funeral service for baby Abel. Remember, we had the aborted baby in the, in the casket, and uh, you were with us for that day, weren't you? Yes, I was. Yes, yes. Tell us about the importance of, of people coming together for uh, services like that. Well, you know, Father, it, it's that we should, we should honor these children. And, and, and give them the blessings that they didn't get because they weren't able to be born. And I think it's very important that everyone um, acknowledges that fact, you know, that, that the child, the child's life has been taken without, I mean, the, the child had um, a tombstone instead of a bassinet right. before he, the child was even born. Yes. So it's mm-hmm. very important for that child to be blessed mm-hmm. and to be buried and to be put to rest. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. In uh, the summer of 2008 is 10 years since Father Robinson and I had the privilege of welcoming you into the Catholic Church. Yes. August the 17th. Yes, of 1998. That was a big wow. step for you. It was. It was the, It was one of the most wonderful experiences I've ever had and in your homily that day on, on how the children forgave me I'll, I'll never forget that mm. I promise yeah. I'll never forget that well you know Norm I know if people want to read more about your story there's your book uh, One by Love yes and then we have a companion supplement to that uh, about you becoming Catholic Yes. And if people want to contact us at gospellife.com, I know you've told us you would uh, autograph copies for them. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So I hope people yeah. would want to contact us and read more about your story, more than that they're hearing just now. Right. right. Well, you know, as, as Father Frank and I, you know, collaborated on, on this and you, and um, I, I just give them away, mm-hmm. you know, to different ones. And um they just call me back and they say, Miss Norma, you didn't tell me this part. And I'm like, I, you know. <laughs> you know. Well, I'm so glad we had this opportunity to get give our, our viewers a little update about how you're doing. Uh, obviously, uh, everyone knows that uh, you appreciate their ongoing prayers because uh, it's, it's... Absolutely, uh, Father. Absolutely. Yeah, and we, we pledge that to you. It's not easy to have gone through what you did go through. But uh, thanks for being with us today. Glad to see you doing so well. Thank you, Father. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Norma. Hello, this is Dr. Teresa Burke, the founder of Rachel's Vineyard. 
One of the many ways to healing after an abortion is a Rachel's Vineyard retreat. This retreat program is increasingly used throughout the world and it's become a ministry of Priests for Life. The weekend experience is rooted in scripture and the sacraments and various biblical events are relived by the participants who, for example, are approached by the priest and ask the same thing that Jesus asked the blind man before healing him. What do you want me to do for you? Participants are able to share their pain in an atmosphere of support and confidentiality and to understand how their abortion has affected various aspects of life and to learn from the stories of others and to confess their sins and to have a memorial service for their child. For more information, visit rachelsvineyard.org. Today, I'd like to offer you a copy of my book, Shockwaves, Abortion's Widest Circle of Victims. Every abortion, aside from killing a child, wounds countless people who are connected with that child. The mom, the dad, the grandparents, the siblings, and the other relatives, the friends of the family, the abortionists and their staff, and the pro-life people also who try to save that baby. My book, Shockwaves, drawing from the research of psychiatrist Dr. Philip Ney and from our experience in Rachel's Vineyard and Silent No More, explores the wounds experienced by these different groups and points the path to healing. Those who promote abortion try to convince us that it is a private, personal decision of a woman. Shockwave shows that nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. Endorsed by prominent cardinals, bishops, and medical experts, Shockwaves is a book you won't want to miss. Order it today online at shockwavesthebook.com or by calling us at 321-500-1000. Again, go to shockwavesthebook.com or give us a call at 321-500-1000. Thank you. Well, if you would like to learn more information about Norma McCorvey, you can go to our Priest for Life website. Just type in priestforlife.org slash Norma. And we have a lot of information there and also uh, links to the, this interview and other interviews we have done with Norma. Uh, she did pass away, like I mentioned before, in February of 2017. Uh, and in fact, Father Pavone and I uh, were in Rome at the time of uh, Norma's passing. But we spoke to her uh, just that, that day uh, that she was dying. Uh, she had what's called the COPD. Uh, and, um, you know, we had a great conversation with her and we actually went into mass in Rome and Norma passed away while we were at mass praying for Norma. Uh, so I know um, she used to always uh, tease me and call me the woman of the East because I, I lived on the East Coast and Norma, of course, lived out West there in Dallas. And uh, we were great friends. She's stayed in my home. I've stayed at her home. And I always promised Norma that don't worry. She used to say to me, listen, girlfriend, you better keep repeating the truth about me so they don't think I ever had an abortion. You better re re do the truth out there. And I promised Norma I always would. So you can be truthful too for Norma. As you saw, you know, she went on a Rachel's Vineyard retreat, which is a ministry of Priest for Life. Uh, Priest for Life, we have helped Norma a lot through the years. But you can also help Norma now because you can do something about bringing an end to abortion. So please be in touch with us at our Priest for Life website. Maybe uh, fill out to get our action alerts, our, our, all the different things and tools we have available to you. So in Norma's memory, uh, may we see the day where we can overturn Roe v. Wade. Thank you.